I feel really sorry for that of California because their economy is just going down the toilet and that's because of the fact that these Green New Deal obsessed, you know, people like Francesca Fiorentini uh, are basically going to cripple California and kill it. Just listen to one researcher who says cap and trade pushes us in the opposite direction of where we need to be going. We need to overcome our addiction to fossil fuels and the problem with cap and trade is, it, is that it stands in the way of doing that in, in many ways. It's, it's, it's a way of providing pollution rights to some of the worst polluters so that they can delay the kind of structural change that's necessary. He's right. That's not how you fight an addiction. If you want to get your brother off heroin, you don't split up his stash between your mom and dad like, let's all just do a little bit of heroin to keep Brad from doing a lot of bit of heroin. At this point, cap and trade isn't even a relevant solution anymore because it's too slow to be viable. California, the second largest carbon polluter in the nation, but first in my heart, reduced its emissions by almost 9% in three years, which is not bad. But do the math. It's not nearly enough if we've got only 12 years to get to zero. Silicon Valley is still going to be underwater, and then we'll have to deal with a whole bunch of flotation device startups, and that just seems exhausting. They're going to turn it into another Detroit because they really don't understand the economics and the importance of business. And thinking that raising the tax rates is somehow going to benefit employment and thinking that's going to somehow uh, benefit their economy as a whole, well, that's rather laughable to say the least because, you know, many of these people will pack up and they will leave and they will go to places like Arizona and Texas. And the sad thing is, is the fact that they take their policies with them. <laughs> so, the very people who voted California into that mess will now move over to that of Arizona and Texas and start voting the same way, you know what I mean? That, that's <laughs> so, cap and trade won't get us there. What about innovation? We'll just ask the science nerds to come up with something. I mean, other than the ones telling us to stop burning fossil fuels. Innovation has been the aim of private companies also looking to get rich off the climate crisis. Floating ideas like geoengineering, which includes one plan to spray reflective aerosols into the stratosphere to block the sun. Yeah, aerosol. If only our climate change denying president knew that this whole time the answer has been hairspray. Turns out, though, that that scheme, like many others, has too many unforeseen side effects to be feasible. Things like stopping rain and totally vindicating chemtrail conspiracists. Okay, first of all, when you go on about that of the market, that's not a free market. And the free market would have far better solutions to such problems. And that is by acknowledging the fact that your climate change claims are just a load of nonsense. In fact, the free market would find ways to better improve the use of such resources and we're already seeing uh, things like that where they're grinding down plastics and using them in roads etc. We don't agree with things that are harmful to the environment uh, such as those measures and the free market would not do so. What you're seeing is corporatism. So where did the market itself, where did the consumers demand for things like that of what we see we're spraying stuff you know into you know our crops etc that we didn't ask for where did you see that you didn't and you're living under corporatism so that's the problem with that argument and yes innovation is the right way forward for looking after the environment but we must acknowledge facts and statistics and from what we can see it's not the CO2 driving temperatures, it's the temperatures driving the CO2. Even if wacky inventions or cap and trade worked, they're still too slow. Meanwhile, the US continues to subsidize the fossil fuel industry to the tune of $649 billion a year. All government subsidies are socialist. That's got nothing to do with capitalism. You know, at the end of the day, you could look at the 19th century and just see all those private companies that failed as a result of government subsidies, meanwhile, free marketeers had given them a showing up. A prime example of that was the hundreds of companies that all went, f you know, under, they faced bankruptcy, they failed with their railroads, and yet along came someone like James J. Hill, who built the only successful railroad in American history, which was the Great Northern Railroad. You compare that to the North Pacific Railroad Company, that took on a government subsidy for every one mile of track that we'd build. 
Hill was interesting in that he used his own fortune. The Great Northern was not a land-grant railroad, so he did not have the advantage that other railroads had in that they were able to leverage the land given to them by the government. What a disastrous failure that turned out to be. So government subsidies are not the answer, and that isn't you know, anything at all to do with capitalism. Capitalism is a system that stands against all of that. It's in favour of the free market. It's not in favour of using government subsidies to redirect, you know, and it basically leads to incompetency. That's essentially what the government subsidies create. So not only are they making the planet uninhabitable, they're getting a goddamn discount. These faux solutions have come and gone, all while climate change has been getting worse. Which means now, we need to do far more in way less time. The longer we wait, the more that the response challenges our economic system, because we need to cut so much and so deeply. What does she mean that the response will challenge our economic system? Well, that's because our economic system is currently based on using up all of Earth's natural resources with no regard for the actual Earth. They don't even know the first thing about the economic calculation problem, and I don't care how tiresome it is. You can check out both videos that I did on that, on the profits and losses, and of course on the variety. See if you don't have the information of profits and losses. See if you don't have the information of market-driven prices. You don't have price signal information. Therefore, you don't know what resources you're going to use. You don't know how much to use. You don't know where you're going to allocate it in the market. Because there's about a billion and one different products. Take, for example, wood. Wood is a resource, but you've got the different types of wood. You've got oak, you've got, you know, birch wood, you've got all the different types of wood. But not only that, you've then got all the different styles of wood and products. They're not all the same. And it's not just redirected to that of producing tables. And then each and every single table all has different styles. And what style of table is it? What's the table used for? And where are you going to allocate it? Her solution to the problem would lead to an absolute disaster, a catastrophe. Both Shmelev and Popov of the Soviet Union, who two Soviet Union economists themselves, had said that, you know, no matter how hard they tried, they would see the surplus waste problems in the Soviet Union. That's what happens when you try to fix prices above or below market value. That's what happens when you think you know better than the free market does. But of course, these people never learn. What she's basically telling you is, she's saying that, oh well, in the current system, well, the current system isn't capitalism. If the current system was capitalism, you would see efficiency. You wouldn't be faced with the economic calculation problem. Keynesians, much like Marxists, and I said this before, as if you just somehow create aggregate supply and then along comes demand. No, that's not how it works. How it works is demand drives production. And therefore, when you leave demand to drive production, you know how much to produce, you know where the resources are going to go in the market, and you know basically what resources to use. You don't just take any willy-nilly, you know, resource and just overuse it and produce it and then just say, hey, along comes demand. <laughs> There's no guarantee that consumer demand will come along. So who's to blame for that? The Keynesians are to blame for that. That's not the fault of the supporters of capitalism. All to turn a profit and create economic growth, or GDP. You remember GDP from our video on the economy, which you should totally watch. And while you're at it, subscribe. Oh, this should be fun. Uh, I would actually really like to do a video response on that one because you could see from the Soviet Union it had a high GDP. You could see from several places. In fact, I actually had a comment from one who actually tried to make Nazi Germany out as if it was this great economic success. What a laughing stock that was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where these people come from. I don't even know how they even drew to that conclusion that Nazi Germany was a successful economy. <laughs> these people are a laughing stock. Now, just because you've got a high GDP does not mean to say that you're producing of anything of value because who's to say that the vast production that you make is going to be of any value to the consumer. There has to be some use value. There has to be a value to the end consumer. 
If the consumer's not going to buy it, then what worth is it? Sitting there on the shelves doing nothing, going to waste. <laughs> it's just not worth anything. Just, just because you produced it, sat it there on the shelf, and nobody's buying it. That didn't mean anything. It's got no use. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there. It's a bit like, <laughs> it's a bit like saying, look, the Soviet Union had high GDP. Oh, how successful it was. Yeah, so successful that, you know, it had pelts that were rotting in warehouses because they overproduced. It's a bit like how, you know, they overproduced more than three pairs of shoes in the late 1980s in the Soviet Union and uh, there was massive big long waiting lines because the shoes that they produced did not meet the taste of the consumer. <laughs> I can't help but laugh at that. These people just don't understand, right? So, <laughs> just because you produce a lot doesn't mean to say you produce anything of value. You need to ensure that what you're producing, and this is the funny part because, you know, Francesca Fiorentini has just sat there, or let's just say stood there, whatever, right? She stood there and she said, that, you know, oh, the current system is using up all these resources and we're causing such great inefficiency. Well, what do you think you're doing by overproducing and producing what consumers are not in demand of? If you do not let consumer drive what is produ what is being produced, if you do not let that free market be in order to do so, then the inevitable consequence you end up creating that waste. GDP is that phantom number that many agree is useless, but is actually incredibly harmful when it comes to climate change. Since when was GDP a sensible measure of human welfare? And yet everything that governments want to do is to try to boost GDP. Now, people like the OECD or the World Bank who say, oh, we're not asking for a lot of growth, just 3% a year. That means doubling in 24 years. Yeah, we're bursting through all the environmental boundaries and screwing the planet already, you want to double it? We have to overthrow this system which is eating the planet with perpetual growth. I love how blown this host's mind is. Rarely do you see the precise moment that someone gets woke. I now see where you're going with the whole GDP thing, which is actually, I thought originally, you were meaning that, okay, well, we can be more efficient with resources, but of course, like I argued on GDP, when it comes to socialism, socialism is just completely wasteful. And of course, I did mention before the difference between theory and practice. But you've actually gone over the cliff. You're actually now complaining about people having a better improved material standard of living, which is just insanity, right? The problem isn't productivity. The problem isn't resource usage, right? The problem isn't to do with that, it's to do with how much and, and what you do with those resources, right? So you could have all the resources there, but it's all a question of what you do with the, the scarce natural resources. And when it comes to socialism, the inevitable consequence you lead to disaster. Now it sounds to me that you're arguing, Francesca Fiorentini, for a type of, you know, economy that goes back to pre-industrial revolution, you know, period of life. That's just insanity. I mean, what are you thinking? It was the machines that enabled us to cut down our working hours. So do you want to take us back to a time period where we're working more than 80 hours a week? You want to take us back to a time period where the living conditions were simply awful? Because they certainly weren't anything to what they are today. And the problem today isn't so much to do with, you know, people's material standards of living and the productivity. The problem is the system that's in place. The great inefficiency. The overuse of scarce natural resources. And who's to blame for that? That is the fault of socialism. That's not the fault of the free market. And like I explained before, the economic calculation problem explains that. So, the problem today is nothing to do with capitalism. That is the fault of socialism because it's all the government price fixing that's causing such a problem. 
you're misallocating valuable scarce resources into the wrong parts of the market, so how can you blame that on capitalism?